Welcome to Sightings. I'm Tim White. January 7th, 1948, five months after the mysterious crash near Roswell, New Mexico, a National Guard pilot on a routine training mission radioed in with a strange message. The pilot, a decorated World War II ace with over 2,800 hours of flight time, told the tower that he was in pursuit of a glowing object he could not identify. Moments later, the pilot, Thomas Mantell, was dead. In 1948, three separate UFO sightings that have come to be known as the classics sparked the modern UFO investigation movement. In response to public demand for answers, the U.S. government established Project Sign. Its stated purpose was to scientifically investigate UFO sightings, and among its first commissions was one of the three classic cases, the mysterious death of pilot Thomas Mantell. Was the World War II flying ace the world's first UFO fatality? Tommy was my big brother. He was three years older than I. And uh, sort of awesome to me, of course. I remember Tommy mostly interested in airplanes. He made model airplanes, and he had them hanging all over his bed. He wanted to be a fighter pilot so bad, but he was too tall. But then... He was very happy when they sent him over to England. And his job was to take the gliders and paratroopers behind the line. And on D-Day, that's what he did. On June 6, 1944, Thomas Mantell proved just what kind of a pilot he was. Mantell's top secret mission was to deliver a glider deep behind enemy lines. Towing the glider behind his unarmed C-24, Mantell came under attack from enemy anti-aircraft fire 100 miles from the drop-off point. The plane was hit, but Mantell kept going and completed his mission, dropping the glider on target. This is what his plane looked like when it landed safely in England. He was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross for heroism and extraordinary achievement in aerial flight. When he got out of the Army, I was hoping he'd get a regular nine to five job, but he still wanted airplanes, so he started his own flying school. Then he joined the Air National Guards, and he liked that because he got to fly fighter planes in the Air National Guard. On January 7th, 1948, six months after receiving the Distinguished Flying Cross, Captain Mantell died during what should have been a routine training mission. He and his flight were retrieving some aircraft that had been undergoing overhaul and maintenance down in Marietta, Georgia. Larry Tabor is an historian and aeronautics expert who's been researching the Mantell case for more than 10 years. When I got into college, I found out that our squadron at the University of Louisville was named after Thomas Mantell, the Arnold Air Society portion of it. And so I began to do more and more research. Tabor has amassed hundreds of civilian and military documents related to the curious death of Thomas Mantell. He was returning from Marietta, Georgia that day with three other men in a flight of P-51 fighters. And they were returning to uh, Stanford Field when they received a call from Godman Tire at Fort Knox to pursue an unidentified flying object that had been in the area. Uh, one of the airplanes uh, did not participate in the flight because it was short of fuel. The other three aircraft continued on, even though two of the aircraft, including Mantell's, were not equipped to go at high altitudes. They did see some type of flying object. They chased it for a certain amount of time there in the early afternoon, and they got to tw about 25,000 feet, and at that point, Mantell's wingman turned back to escort the less experienced pilot down. I, of course, find that strange since it's the job of a wingman to stay with his flight leader at all time. Mantell chose to continue to chase the object, something that he felt was a threat to the security of America. At some point, Mantell said, I see the object. I'm going to pursue it a little bit further. And that was the last contact that anybody had with Mantell. He went up to above 33,000 and at that point appears to have died from anoxia or lack of oxygen. The aircraft uh, was continuing its high power climb. Of course, with Mantell dead, eventually the aircraft heeled over from torque and came down in a spin where it crashed in a field down in Franklin, Kentucky. We were not told or informed by the Air Force 
They wanted to sweep it under the rug with as little attention to themselves as possible, whether it be because they felt they were at fault for sending him or if it was something they didn't want to talk about, what he was chasing. A neighbor that lived three houses down came to our house and told my mother what had happened. Two neighbors from down the street came in and they um, said, Peggy, we've got something we've got to tell you. And of course, I had no idea what it was. And they told me, they said, Tommy's had a crash. And I said, oh, is he all right? And they said, no, he was killed. The main thing I recall was standing in my brother's home with his wife, and we were all standing in a circle, holding hands, and my mother said, the circle's broken. And I might say she was broken also. For nearly 50 years, the family of Thomas Mantell has searched for an explanation. The military's silence has contributed to a flood of contradictory rumors. Mantell's body was found riddled with bullets. The body was missing. The plane had disintegrated. The wreckage was radioactive. And most disturbing of all, that Thomas Mantell's P-51 was knocked down by an extraterrestrial spacecraft. When we come back, our sightings investigative team returns to the crash site. Remarkably, after nearly 50 years and a thorough military investigation, Sightings was still able to find additional pieces of wreckage from Thomas Mantell's P-51. National Guard pilot Thomas Mantell, on a routine training mission, spotted what he believed was a UFO bearing down on him. Moments later, his plane crashed, and from that day to this, his family has never known why. They've always had the theory. I still hear the Venus theory and the... Uh, most recently, the balloon theory, the top secret balloon that was out at that time. The Air Force will neither confirm nor deny the existence of a balloon near Godman Field that day. But there is compelling evidence that such a balloon did exist. In the hours before Mantell's UFO sightings and subsequent death, several bases reported seeing a UFO overhead, traveling at 250 miles per hour. One air controller described it as round and white, resembling a parachute. The Navy Skyhook balloon program was aimed at carrying cosmic ray experiments into the stratosphere. And the January 6, 1948 flight carried instruments, I believe, for the University of Minnesota Physics Department. Chief Engineer Charles Moore believes that the Skyhook balloon launched on January 6th was directly responsible for Thomas Mantell's death on January 7th. We heard uh, reports of a large white object being seen in the sky over Illinois. And later we heard uh, reports of a similar object being seen over Kentucky. And this was the first time that anyone in uh, the central United States had ever seen such a high-flying balloon. But there are serious discrepancies between the actual flight pattern of a Skyhook balloon and what Thomas Mantell reported seeing. He described an object traveling up and forward as fast as he was, and that the UFO was metallic and of tremendous size. I do believe, and I always will, that it was a cover-up because they never came to talk to anybody in my family about what had happened. They more or less just let us assume what had happened on our own. I'm very angry sometimes as the Air Force. I feel like they know more than they're telling us. It's affected my children because they never knew their daddy growing up. They were just children. I feel that he was intelligent and experienced enough not to have made the mistake of chasing a balloon. On several occasions, he said he couldn't gain on the object. It even appeared to be going faster than he was. I think it's possible that Captain Mantell uh, did see the balloon and uh, uh, attempt to chase it, I would suspect it would have been high above him so that he had uh, no possibility whatsoever of climbing to the altitude where the balloon was floating, still in the stratosphere. When I first started doing research many years ago, one of the things that I heard was the fact that the aircraft had small holes in it 
It was ionized, and it came about because Captain Mantell had gotten close enough to the exhaust system of whatever type of flying object that it was, and when this uh, UFO kicked into high gear to leave our orbit, he was caught in the exhaust blast. If Captain Mantell had been caught in a radioactive backwash, the wreckage of his plane would tell the story best. Sighting sent an investigative team to the crash site in Franklin, Kentucky, with the hope that clues to the Mantell mystery might still litter this field. It was the first time the family had been to the crash site. At the time of the accident, uh, we were not able to come here. They threw security all in the whole area. Glenn and Anna Margaret Mays were two of the first people on the scene. I mean, it was like pandemonium. You know how people just congregating, and and it was, you know, the road was full of cars, and people were coming. Mm -hmm. How long did they keep the area blocked off? For a good while, didn't they, Glenn? Pretty good while. I don't know exactly how long. Oh, two or three days. They, they brought a truck and a dozer down here from Fort Knox, and, and uh, loaded uh, what was left of the plane on a truck, and, and took a dozer and buried you know, That's what we heard. Hold up. We just heard that, uh -huh. that information today. Yeah, we heard that. After 46 years, Glenn Mays thought he remembered the location where the military had buried wreckage from Mantell's yeah. plane. After so many day. years, our team had few expectations, but the family had high hopes. He's right up in there, a bunch of weeds right in there, pretty close. Right up in there where them weeds are. I'm getting some radiation spikes. There were pockets of high radiation in the field, but when our team began to dig, there were no signs of metal debris. I sent him back to fetch a picture he has showing where the aircraft crashed. If that can give us a perhaps a better determination of how far it is from the barn and if the military's records are accurate or not. Our sightings camera crew matched the angle and the depth of field shown in this old newspaper clipping. It may not have been the most technically sophisticated method the team tried, but it worked. <laughs> yep. Aircraft. It's green, isn't it? Yeah, it's chromate green. That's the interior of the aircraft. That's a, one of the spars. There you go. It's not necessarily all over. It's just like on sections. That's interesting. See? Here, it'll spike, but up here, it goes back to normal. In just the few remaining hours of daylight, Larry Tabor and the sightings team found over two dozen pieces of wreckage. Fortunately, there are serial numbers on several pieces of uh, the aircraft that were recovered, and these can be traced to ensure that it did come from the airplane that Captain Mantell was flying that day. I hope what you all are doing brings to light some of, because I was hoping before I passed on that I find out what it is. If this is wreckage from Mantell's plane, why was it buried in an unmarked trench by the same military that had promised to do a thorough investigation? And why does it refuse to answer the Mantell family's simple plea? What happened to Tommy? As far as the military cover-up, I believe there was, at that time, very much a cover-up of the whole incident. To me, that's why there's always been a question. Maybe it was a UFO. How do we know? <laughs> he was too good of a pilot to take a risk in his, of his life and to hurt his family, to go chasing after something that wasn't there. Sightings has notified Air Force officials at the Pentagon that we have found what appears to be wreckage from Thomas Mantell's P-51. Sightings has also requested all information pertaining to this incident under the Freedom of Information Act. We hope to bring you the response to these inquiries on a future broadcast.